So yeah, I'm Robin. I'm a product designer at Endless. Um, bear with me. This lovely deck you'll see was just built this morning, fresh off the presses, with no spell check or anything, um, on a tablet. So <laughs> it was really fun. Um, yeah, so uh, my talk is about building for humans. And you'll see I, uh, I crossed out designing for humans because um, I wanted to sort of recontextualize the process of uh, human-centered design um, with sort of a, the broader audience in mind. I think that um, uh, the word design has a lot of like heavy-weighted meanings. And um, pe when people hear human-centered design or um, design thinking or design process, they automatically think, oh, well, that has to do with design, you know, and it has lots of implications. That isn't, you know, that's not for me because I'm an engineer, I'm a developer. Um, but what really is the idea is that everything around us in the built world is actually also designed. So, you know, whether you're building an app and, you know, you are the app builder, designer, creator, um, you are both the designer and the builder of that app. And so, you know, we don't need to have a, a, a stark line between um, the activities of designing and building. I think that they're all part of the same process. Um, so designing equals building. And many people think of designing as, you know, iconography, signage, pushing pixels around, and, um, you know, building is building apps or building things in the built world. Um, that's a funicular. Um, at the Sugarloaf in um, Rio de Janeiro. And yeah, and um, these ideas I'm sort of speaking to in the context of designing for humans, but um, they could, you could probably also design for robots, and you could also probably design for cats using the same principles, but we're going to be talking about humans. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to give a little overview on the design thinking process. Um, and I'm also going to rename the design thinking process as the critical thinking process because, you know, really when you call it design thinking, you're kind of limiting the idea of what is actually involved in design thinking. Um, design thinking does involve designing, but it also involves like, activities that are more like anthropology, uh, psychology, trying to understand the psychology and motives of the people that you're building and designing for. Um, semiology, which is basically a fancy word for sort of understanding how people communicate and the context and the mediums and symbols that are used to communicate. And then, you know, ultimately, all of it fits under the umbrella of problem solving. And really, the design thinking process is really just about solving a problem. So the critical thinking process uh, there's, you know, many thinkers who have um, sort of mapped out different steps of this. This is the one that I really like. Um, it's, uh, it's been created by IDEO, and they're, you know, really, they have a lot of really good research in sort of human-centered design and human-centered building. But um, there's a five-stage process that sort of goes linearly at first, but you can always hop back to previous stages in the process. And um, I'm going to be really focusing on you know, the first stage. And, and really, in all of these points in the process, um, there's going to be an underlying theme of user research. Um, so the first phase is empathize, which is basically understanding your users. What are their goals? What are their pain points? What is the context in which they live? You know, where, where, where do they live? How many kids do they have? Or, you know, what device do they use? What input devices? All of those things go into, um, you know, the types of experiences that they'll have when using your product. Uh, once you really understand who you're building for, you can start to define your problem with a little bit more clarity. And when you do that, um, you know, you have your stakeholders or your ideas of what you want the product to be. But when you sort of filter that through the lens of everything you've learned when you've started to research your users, um, you can define the problem a little, bit, um, a little bit better. And then once you go through that stage, you can start to ideate. 
and, um, and then of course prototype. And prototyping can mean a lot of things. Um, but ultimately, like a prototype could be a paper prototype, it could be post-it notes, it could al also be um, kind of something like a, a fully fleshed and finished uh, piece of software. Because ultimately, you're going to test that, and then you're going to iterate on it. So you're really never finished, especially when you're thinking of software design. I mean, is any software ever finished? So, yeah. So that's sort of crash course on the design thinking process. Why do we do this? Uh, we want to figure out what our users really need. We want to figure out if we're even solving for the right problem. We want to and we want to understand what our users' goals, context, and pain points are. And then, of course, there's lots of other reasons. Um, so when you're going through this design process or the, quali the, the um, critical thinking process, um, you're going to be moving generally from a qualitative uh, research process to more quantitative. And that's because when you're first starting out, um, you really don't have anything to quantify. You, you kind of are just like trying to understand like what is the landscape that you're living in. So you really need to um, do things like user interviews, observations, so just going out to where your users are and observing sort of what their workspace is like or what their homes are like or what you know, devices they're using or how many kids they have and if there's even space on a desk for a desktop computer. You know? um, and then card sorting is another activity which I'll talk more about in a bit. Um, and then when we start to learn some of these things, we can, create, uh, we can generate user personas. And these are basically ideas, um, kind of like symbols of our users that we can continuously refer back to throughout the building process to make sure um, that we're checking our assumptions and, and making sure that we're reminding ourselves like, okay, is, is this decision I'm making serving their needs? Um, and then, you know, ongoing user feedback of prototypes. Um, and then uh, quantitative testing can be um, A-B testing using, um, so A-B testing can be qualitative if you do it in person, but you can also use tools to do A-B testing. Um, and like, like on, for websites, you can launch two versions of a website and sort of test the traction of both versions and see how it goes. Um, so that's a type of quantitative uh, user research. There's also eye tracking, so you can um, use different eye tracking software to see if the users are even looking at the right spots on the screen. You know, if they're spending all this time over here, but you really want to guide them through like these main features, then you know that you you really haven't gotten the hierarchy right, and you kind of need to work rework it. And then of course uh, usage metrics, um, and there's there's a there's a bunch of others. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, so these are um, kind of just some overviews of the different types of research. Um, one thing that we've done a lot at Endless, um, and we, we don't do nearly as much um, user research as we want to, but something that's been really important for us is um, the qualitative user research of going into the field, because ultimately, um, you know, we, we're building for people that have entirely different experiences than we have. Um, you know, we're like based in San Francisco and London and all over the place, but we're building for people who live in, you know, favelas in, in Rio, in islands in uh, Indonesia. And so, you know, you can't make a lot of assumptions about what, you know, they need and what their lives are like. Um, so these are just some pictures from, um, different user research trips, and this lady has all these kids climbing around, and there's nowhere to put a computer, and um, you know, it's, it's always fun and kind of very informative. And then um, another thing that becomes a little more concrete is card sorting. And card sorting is a great way for um, having users sort ideas, and you can start to get a map of different users' mental models and you know, things that they associate with each other. And you can do stuff with this like um, help inform information architecture of an app or a website or a software product. You know, because you, you have your idea of how sort of your software or your app should be organized and what the hierarchy is, but your users might have a totally different sense of what that should be. 
or, it, or what makes sense to them. Um, and then A-B testing is another one we do both um, in a qualitative manner and we're, we're trying to do more um, in a quantitative manner. But you know, we start by, we set up a protocol um, and then we usually have a prototype. And, um, and then we go through and we, we, we talk to people and you know, have them try the different um, versions of a, of a piece of software and you know, just observe them and then ask questions about their different experiences with it. Um, so these are, um, this is also in the field and um, this girl is uh, testing a prototype that we built and actually the prototype is running on um, GNOME, <laughs> you see right there. I hadn't launched the prototype yet. Um, and then, um, of course, eye tracking. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's one of the things that, you know, um, it's been sort of a tried and true method. And um, I know that, you know, as, it, as developers and engineers, you know, you really want to quickly grow, get to concrete results, so it's a really good way to do that. Um, and, um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna be exhaustive about all of it, but um, I wanted to go back to um, the point about um, observing the world around you to learn about you know, people and learn about how people use things and use that to inform your, uh, your building and your projects and your process and even inspire you for new ideas. Um, so there's a woman named um, Jane Fulton Suri. She's also, um, was part of IDEO, and she came up with this idea of thoughtless acts. And thoughtless acts are things that people do just as they're moving about the world, and you know, and they they, they sort of prop a door open with something, or you know, um, kind of repurpose the use of something to for something else. And you know, by by observing these things, we can we can learn about you know what's not working with the world, but also like where there are opportunities. And, and people are ultimately like the designers of their own, um, their own space, and they're going to use things, you know, however is convenient for them. And it can be, um, you know, a really way, great way to like on a daily basis exercise, you know, your uh, your your abilities to um, to sort of just observe and learn about how people people use things. And um, actually, the quote's really nice. Thoughtless acts reveal just how natural it is for everyone to design, modify, and rearrange the world to make it work better for them. We draw on the capacity every day in our quest to create useful products and services for others. Um, and yeah, and I'd like you guys to join me on my quest for delight and usability. And um, you can reach me via email, um, either to my personal email or my endless email, I can reply to either. Um, and uh, the, the artwork behind this, it's um, this artist, uh, forgetting her name, but um, she has a website called The Uncomfortable, and she uh, reappropriates and rebuilds uh, products so that they're completely unusable as sort of a Dada you know, art experiment. Um, just as, you know, um, Any questions? Anyone? Which eye tracker do you use? Um, Is it Toby? I hate Toby. I ha we're not currently using one right now, so I've used Toby in the past, but I, I haven't. I have. We're not currently using an eye tracker at this moment, so um, I don't know the share, but we, we we probably will be soon. Do you know if there's any open source eye trackers? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know. There is. Uh, one is called uh, Pupil Labs. It's amazing. It's all open source, 3D printed. All their, uh, all their uh, software is all in Python. And all of their hardware is all, uh, all the 3D scans are available so you can print your own accessories. Um, and it's all fully modu modular and all their designs are open source. You can just make your own and not even buy it from them. But they're cool and they're in Helsinki, which is also cool. So. Cool. <laughs> So I'm not sure how to phrase this question exactly, but regarding thoughtless acts, I thought it was pretty interesting. Often in a software, 
you have an idea about how people are going to use something, and then you find that they exploit another feature to achieve what you had planned that they would do otherwise, possibly because you, of performance or mm -hmm. other reasons, and they're working around your bugs, but it builds a knowledge base that you want to avoid. Right. And from your perspective of designing products, how would you mitigate this or work? When this happens, what would you do? I mean, I think, you know, just, just like sort of observing the thoughtless acts, acts in the physical world, when you can find um, your users sort of using your software in um, unexpected ways, it can mean one of two things. Um, it can mean that something isn't working well for them. And so you need to understand what isn't working and, and why. Is it, you know, is it performance? Is it that the, you know, the, the UX model doesn't make sense to them? Or there's something about it that isn't quite meeting their needs? Um, and then that's the second thing is, is like if they're sort of manipulating um, the use of something, it's, it's maybe that you haven't sort of fully thought out all of the features that they, they might need or, that, or the things that they might want to do with it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily see it as like a, a mental model that you want to avoid, but you would want to understand more about it because that's an opportunity to evolve your product. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. I know it's happened for us. In the first case, right, um, when you fix it, right, then you have this knowledge base that's already done the other way, but then it, it becomes less efficient because you fixed the right way. But uh, I don't know. That's, that's the, yeah. the kind of corner that you find yourself in, I just wonder. Well, right. I guess it's not an answerable question, really, but... Yeah, I mean, a lot of these questions aren't quite answerable. I'd be really interested to hear more later about what that case is, and we can, like get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, I mean, it, one of the challenges in sort of usability is, is it's really not a one size fits all thing and it's constantly evolving as mediums change and you know, best practices evolve with the mediums themselves, so, and, 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 and people. Hey, so when building or designing software, um, so let's say you've got two masses of users with like contra contradictory preferences. How do you proceed on that case? Like, do you just find where or which which mass is the fifty one plus percent, and you go with that with that direction? Um, I don't know if I quite understand your question. Is it, so? Is this about A/B testing? No, or? it's a, uh, straight up about designing software. So, like. I know uh, go with something simple. So, some people, um, like half of your users, would want it um, to do it the X way, and oh. the other half would want it the Y A, uh, the Y way. So, how do you proceed? So that's always a dilemma in product design. I think more or less, yeah. More or less. I mean, I think you know that's why I'm, I was having a conversation with somebody last night. That's why no, you know, Linux is so beautiful because we've actually learned that operating systems themselves are not one size fits all. I think you know there's some users that would like things to be very simple and some that want to have lots of you know complexity and power and multitasking. Um, you know, and and you know for for your own software that that can be really difficult. You can't maintain two things for two users, and I think you know the best thing you can do is try to like tease out what is why the different users like things a certain way, and you know and then end up you know you have to you have to see if if there's a way that you can meet both of their needs, and usually there isn't, so you have to just pick one, and it is really hard. 